Breaking the silence is not easy. Breaking the silence around whatever violence you're experiencing isn't an easy thing for everybody, right? It takes a lot of strength, courage, vulnerability to speak out and to say somebody has hurt me. Okay, who is Yolanda Kyanki? Well, my government name is Samantha Yolanda Kyanki. I'm from Johannesburg, South Africa, born and raised. And um, I like to identify as a feminist activist or an African feminist activist or a radical feminist activist, you know, um, depends on the day um, and what we're faced with. And, you know, like I'm just a person who's discovering themselves in this world, you know, like in this society that we live in. Um, I'm just a person. In 2016, I participated in the hashtag Are You Reference List anti-rape culture protests. And these protests erupted at Rhodes University um, on the 17th of April, which was a Sunday evening. And, you know, just to give a brief history, really, is that they were triggered by a post, a social media post on one of the student body pages where a list of 11 names was shared, right? And this list it didn't say or name anybody as a rapist or anything like that. It just was the list that was written, reference list, 11 names, and at the bottom, et al, in Latin, which means and more, right? And it was shared on social media during a time where there was already conversations and campaigning happening on campus around the general unsafety that mostly women students, um, I mean, we could say everybody, but, you know, it was mostly women students and, and members of the LGBTQI community who, you know, were raising these issues around their safety. They didn't feel safe. Um, there was an issue of rape and sexual violence, sexual and gender-based violence on campus and around campus, the community of Grahamstown. And so with those conversations, I think when that list dropped, what it did was really just surface i think or it turned the volume up rather on what was already happening on the ground that then led to mass action on the 17th of april where initially the movement then um, started and it was just a response you know students were fed up were breaking the silence i participated because i myself was um i am a rape survivor i was raped in 2015 at Rhodes as a first year student and so you know having participated in the silent protests in that year um, which is you know an, an annual event if you'd like or annual commemoration to um to survivors of sexual violence and really i guess it feeds into the larger campaigning that the university at the time um had going on which was really the silent protest so i participated in that and then 2016 happens you know i'm carrying this trauma um with me and you know i guess with my activism because i was i was an involved student activist you know i found community amongst other people who shared you know similar um feelings around you know the issues that we were facing as students and you know the movement was resilient for a number of weeks to follow but on the Wednesday, three days in or so into the protests, you know, now we had shut down. Um, there was a full on like shutdown with demanding action, response, something. Um, but it could not be business as usual. It turned out that the university applied for an urgent interdict at the Gramson High Court. And I, you know, caught wind of this on the ground on a hot day we're trying to figure out what's the way forward and you know rumors are circulating that yo you know the court has granted the the management an interdict which essentially means we need to put a stop to the protest and not only that but the university interdicted the whole student body the src included but i, I was one of the three indiv individually named because we were supposedly identified as leaders of of this protest action right obviously it was really it was i was scared i was confused i didn't know what this meant if i was if this gave you know the university a, an upper hand to maybe get me arrested and then first of december i think it was or the second of december of that very year most of the interdict was thrown out um the legalities happened with that uh and you know we move on into 2017 and this is me doing my third year at Rhodes. And around March or so, my lawyers got contacted by the institution's lawyers, I think. They got served with papers that said Yolanda 
is being charged with four charges um, for her, her alleged involvement in the protest. And so we are instituting a disciplinary hearing. And, you know, obviously at the time, you know, I thought, okay, sure, severe, maybe I'll get, you know, like, what is severe hours? Because, you know, that's usually what the institution it, it does or did, you know, gave hours if you were found guilty for whatever. And no, it was, you could get excluded. You could actually lose your, your degree. And, you know, that's when the reality kicked in that shit. It's quite real. Uh, at the time, all of us were surprised that, it, it, that this had come. Uh, but we made a commitment to represent Yolanda. And the reason we did that is because for us, we know, first of all, we are a country that has a myriad of problems that relate to exploitation, to oppression. And we felt that the cause that was being fought by the students is a cause uh, that is very close to us. Already at that time, the country was seething, uh, was reeling from the impact of gender-based violence. And we felt the cause the students had taken up was very important. She was a young woman who had high expectations for her life and that exclusion would impact her. And we felt that we were committed to making sure that we do our best to represent her. So during those proceedings, almost, I mean, I think at that time, the proceedings had set for over three months from June 2017 up to September 2017. There was discussions about when the matter would be heard again. That was a very crucial time because it was going to be the time that Yolanda would then give her own evidence of what had happened and defend herself. And so we spent five, six months of 2017 preparing, you know, building a case, being served papers, you know, there's the whole legalities with that. And the disciplinary hearing set, I think, around June for the first time, which would mark, you know, the first of a five month long process. And, you know, again, three women were charged with kidnapping, assault, defamation and insubordination. Right. And, you know, obviously we prepared, we prepared. And so the lawyers literally said on record that our client, which is the university, wants this case closed, you know, there to be a conclusion as soon as possible by the end of the year and preferably even before that. And, you know, so obviously it was like, okay, they're really pushing for a verdict and obviously one that's in their favor, probably. The dates that were proposed by the university at that time were dates that one, the advocates that we had, been, we had appointed were not going to be available. Two, there were days where Yolanda was supposed to be writing exams. Um, at the time, the university policy was that if a student is writing exams, even if they are undergoing disciplinary action, they're given an opportunity to write their exams. And the university insisted on postponing to these dates. So it was, I think, the 26th of October and dates in the, in the beginning of November 2017 and wouldn't postpone. We, of course, made submissions to the proctor, who was the person chairing and in charge of the disciplinary hearing, and he decided the matter would proceed anyway. We then didn't just simply uh, leave it there. We made a formal application asking him to postpone the matter so that Yolanda could have the two advocates who've been assisting her for the three months there to lead her evidence. And again, we received a one-page refusal uh, from the proctor. And probably some six to eight weeks later, we received uh, a ruling that had found Yolanda guilty. Uh, a few days later, a ruling that had excluded her from Rhodes permanently. And I got excluded on the 17th of November. A few weeks after that, got an email from my lawyers from Seri, and they, it was a Friday. And it was just like, yeah, Friday afternoon, Yolanda, I've just got an email with the verdict. You've been excluded and I had two final exams left the following week literally it was the 17th of November the following week I'd be writing my final my two last papers of my third year and my undergrad and then I would have been done it's very difficult not to be emotional because I think at the time all of us were crushed what that ruling meant is that a young black woman's life had been stopped a comma had been put and we wanted to take steps to assist Yolanda to review that decision not just because we believe in Yolanda's cause and we believe in who she is as a person but also because the process had not been fair to her she had not been given an opportunity to tell her side of the story something that is as old as a principle in law as even from the apartheid days so we had an expectation of what the university would do if at the very least give this young woman a chance to tell her side of the story 
But for me personally, one of the things that stood out for me is how in that process, there was no appreciation that they were dealing with a young woman, a young person. In fact, at the time, Yolanda was a teenager. She, she was just 19. And there was no appreciation of what that ruling would mean for her. If the university accepts that the way they've been dealing with the victims of sexual assault, of gender-based violence on campus was insufficient, and if they accept that even minutely they contributed towards the culture, um, the, the sexual violence culture on campus, then they would have done acted differently, both in, of course, implementing those changes, but also responding to the activists who brought it to light. But there's something that Yolanda said a few years into her case, uh, and she was sharing with me about why she's pursuing the case. And she said to me, Sis Namsam, you need to understand, this is my life. And if you, if you have a picture of what the university's action has done to me and what it's continuing to do to my life, if I gave up now, it would be the equivalent of me laying on the middle of the road and allowing them to ride over me. I cannot allow that. I have to stand up for myself. It doesn't matter who fails me. It doesn't matter what outcomes come out in court, but I have to stand up for myself because I want to be able to stand a few years, a few years from here and say, at the very least, I stood up for myself. And I think for, for, for us and for the team, I mean, I've shared this with the, with the legal team that works with her, that that always rings in my ear. Of course, one is an organization. We don't want to be counted amongst the people that failed her. For, as an organization, we want to stand on the right side of history. But also, we want to support someone who says, I will not be silenced. I will not give up my right to speak. I will not give up my future. I mean, the, it's... It's, it's mind-boggling how no one understands that this is about Yolanda's future. Every now and again, people will be like, but why is she fighting it? Why is she not given up? Why is it now she's appealing it to this court and that court? The Constitution guarantees her that. She's guaranteed the right to follow every appellate process. Um, and I think even, even at the time, if we get to the point where we're now before the last court and she's lost, it will only be right for her to even at that moment stand in hope because this is her life and this is her future. I don't regret my participation in the movement at all. Yeah, you know, for me, it was just a, a, a space where I could breathe, grieve, um, be heard and, you know, possibly dream for some sort of justice. After we got the, the ruling from the proctor, uh, we brought a review application to have his ruling set aside. What we were asking for before the High Court was we were asking for the High Court to set aside the finding that Yolanda was guilty, together with the punishment or the disciplinary proct had put in place. Mm -hmm. We were asking that the, the hearing must be returned to someone, a different proctor who is impartial, so that Yolanda can tell her side of the story. So when we went to the High Court, the High Court decided against us and Yolanda, and we've now appealed the ruling of the High Court. We are asking the Supreme Court of Appeal to, of course, consider whether it was appropriate for the proctor to postpone to a date where Yolanda's lawyers would not be available, especially to do so without considering Yolanda's interests and weighing them against the interests of the university. If the proctor had postponed, we probably wouldn't be here, but he didn't postpone. And as I explained earlier, the time was so crucial Yolanda was meant to start her case in the High Court and even in the Supreme Court of Appeal. Uh, the university, of course, admits that Yolanda had been preparing to come and give her evidence. And what we would want is we want her to have the opportunity to give her evidence in defense of herself and then have someone who's impartial come and make a decision. So in the Supreme Court of Appeal, there's really two points that we are taking the the judgments on, the judgments by the proctor. One is the fact that he should have postponed to give the lawyers the opportunity to represent Yolanda. The second one is, is about how he had been acting in the disciplinary hearing. From where Yolanda stands, and I think even as we stood as her, as her lawyers, we felt that the proctor was biased against her, and we feel that there is enough information uh, looking at what transpired, not only 
when the decision to postpone was made, but even at the beginning of the disciplinary hearing, which shows that the proctor did not really appreciate that he does not act for the university, that he is an independent disciplinary chairperson who must make a decision, uh, having heard all the parties. I don't have a choice right now to go back. Really, the only thing I can do is focus on the present and really hope that, you know, somebody might hear my story out, you know, and give me that little piece or taste of justice. And so, yeah, this, re this moment really is about the courts intervening, the courts really deciding and saying, you know, was my exclusion fair? or the grounds of my exclusion, rather, why, were they fair, you know? Um, was the process fair? Was it procedurally fair to myself, not only to, the, to, to Rhodes University? And this really is about just clearing my name. It is about fighting back and pushing back, because I, too, have rights. You know, we all have rights as people. We have responsibilities. And, you know, this moment is also about the fact that I have a responsibility to, to push back. I have that responsibility to stand up for myself because if I don't, nobody else will. Are you still as angry as you were with Rhodes in 2017 when they excluded you from the university? With the years, right, as I was trying to say, that with all that's happened, I've gained actually more strength. Um, with the losses, because I have lost, you know, we've approached the High Court, we've appro approached the Constitutional Court, we went back to the High Court, you know, and now we're going to the Supreme Court of Appeal. and. Yeah, I wouldn't say I'm angry. It's about justice. It's about clearing my name. It's really just about acting on the tools that are available to me to fight back. And um, it's to say that they can't simply just get away with treating me or anybody rather in the way that they have done so. So I'm not angry. This really is about allowing the law to take its course. And all I can do is really just hope that the truth prevails. I felt really confident on the day of the hearing. You know, it had been a long time coming. Um, but I think most important, importantly was the fact that our story, our case that we were presenting before the Supreme Court hadn't changed, you know, the entire time. So it was just a matter of the, just like, you know, having faith and trusting the fact that these five judges um, will hopefully really hear me out um, and grant me justice and which they did you know so i was confident and i think it also came from just the general energy that i was i i had from my lawyers as well they were confident um at that specific point although it's been a long journey there's been ups and downs but on that specific day you know it was just like a do or die so yeah we were very optimistic on that day because the court firstly seemed receptive to our arguments, um, but more, most importantly, they asked questions um, that related to the amount of time the university was not willing to give up. Um, they, it was clear that they saw Yolanda um, as, as a litigant who needed to be heard. Firstly, it means she doesn't have to explain the sanction and the finding of guilt to every potential employer to every potential academic, academic institution. Uh, it also means that the journey that she's been on for the last four years was not for nothing. You know, she has been fighting and the court said, we hear you, you should have been given an opportunity to tell your side of the story, you were not. And because of that, you couldn't have been found guilty. You couldn't have been excluded from Rhodes full time. Um, and fortunately or unfortunately, um, the ball is left in the university's court. The university must decide what the next step is. Uh, do they charge Yolanda again? Um, or do they let Yolanda continue with her life? Um, at this point, unfortunately, we do not know what they intend to do.
Well, I feel ecstatic because my name has finally been cleared, which is really what I was fighting for, having my name cleared um, and just not allowing, you know, Rose just get away with what they have for the past couple of years. And so, you know, not only has the court reprimanded the the, the institution, you know, it, it, it has had its own fair share of harsh words. Um, that it's expressed two roads, you know, how it needs to look in the mirror. They need to look in the mirror, really, and ask themselves <laughs> some very um, deep questions. But look, I'm, I'm happy. Um, of course, nothing really has changed overnight, per se, in terms of my life. Um, I'm still unemployed. There's that. There's the reality of having to figure out how I go back to school. Because as it is, you know, I am technically... A third year student at Rhodes and I am a registered second year student uh, at UNISA so it's like what do I do um, options options but I'm, I'm happy I'm, I'm happy you know and I'm just leaving it to God that th th things will start you know working out in my favor after this because it has been like a huge hindrance on my life um i feel in terms of like getting any opportunities but yeah interestingly when we started this case we felt that the law is quite clear um that universities are public institutions that when when they act to discipline students they're exercising a public power and therefore there has to be both a substantive and a procedural fairness which means at the very least that each student who's disciplined gets an opportunity to tell their side of the story um, and so when we brought the review, we were quite confident that we would succeed on this point, especially because the university had not allowed Yolanda that opportunity by taking away her legal representation. And as lawyers, we always understood that if a lawyer is engaged in a case, when you want to arrange uh, a, a further appearance, you consider their availability, especially if they've been, if they've been involved for some time. And in this case, the, the Supreme Court of Appeal um, raised the fact that Nyanda's facts, they'd been, they'd been advocates appointed for her, they'd been engaged for over 12 days, um, they were not available, no one disputed the reasons why they were, not, they were not available. But for some reason, both the proctor and the university took a stance that she simply didn't want to um, avail herself to, this, to the disciplinary hearing. And what the Supreme Court of Appeal says is that one, you have one, you have a right to, to representation. It's going to be rare that you'll have a right to specific representation, but you must look at the specific facts at that moment. So any other university, be it Rhodes, be it Vets or be it UCT, who's disciplining that students would have to say, what, what does, what does um, the unavailability of that advocate or that attorney mean for this student? Uh, and for Yolanda specifically, it meant that she couldn't been led by the people that prepared her. She couldn't, the people who'd been running her case for over, I think at that time, over three months, wouldn't be available. And the court says, chances are, you might have a circumstance where you'll say, actually, you don't, you don't get that right. But then there must be strong reasons for why not. Um, and again here, Yolanda was disciplined a year after the incident happened. Uh, in when she received, when she was charged, three months passed. She'd had the first date of the hearing. So the university had already spent 12 months in its own delays. There, was, there, hasn't had, there hadn't been the disciplinary hearing any delay on, because of Yolanda herself. Um, and in this case, what the Supreme Court of Appeal says is you must, you, as the university, you must provide strong reasons for why you don't give the rights the right to a specific to, to a specific legal representative. So in in, in, in in Yolanda's case, there were no reasons at all. Not even that there were weak reasons or poor reasons. There were no reasons at all. And 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 the court even says it's worse because even in the litigation after the fact, no reasons were offered other than to say, as the university, we want this done by this specific date. No one has given an explanation of why is that date the magic number? Why couldn't it be a month later? as Yolanda's advocates had asked, uh, or even two months later, no one has provided that. And the court says, that's simply not good enough. Um, especially if someone is gonna lose three years of her life, is gonna, is gonna lose um, fees, is gonna lose her future, 
then you, you must provide stronger reasons. And I think for other students who are in the very same position, they'll be able to say the Supreme Court of Appeal has restated the law strongly to say, you must give me the right to defend myself, especially if I'm at risk of, of losing my degree or of losing my future or just simply losing the amount of time that I've invested in this university. As things stand now, we are all waiting for the university. The university has said nothing. Uh, we, we don't know if they intend to charge Yolanda again. Uh, I, I feel strongly that if they did charge Yolanda again, uh, as Sarah would want to represent her in, 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 those, in those disciplinary proceedings, we are comforted by the fact that the, the Supreme Court of Appeal has said it must be before a different proctor because this proctor failed to give reasons for, uh, for giving a decision that altered Yolanda's life for the worse. Um, and I know that as, as things stand now, Yolanda herself probably has questions about what does this judgment, what does succeeding now means? Because she's succeeded now, but she's lost four years of her life. Um, and even the degree that she was studying as probably as the young woman who, who, who moved from Gauteng to the Eastern Cape doesn't have the same resonance for her. Um, and I think we are in, in discussions with her about what, what she wants to do, what does the law allow her to do, but I think that at this point there's a lot of uncertainty. Where to from here? I think I'll just spend, you know, the rest of my, my days and years just advocating for the realization of women's rights. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously passionate about gender activism, um, fighting the patriarchy. So I will continue doing that through my organization that I am trying to grow called Archive Amabali Wetu, which essentially, you know, speaks to archiving and documenting black women's experiences as we navigate through you know this the system that we live in but apart from that only god knows what you know tomorrow has in store for me but i really hope it's 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 a brighter future than it has been for the past couple of years honestly what i've learned is the fact that you you only have yourself you have, I have my family, yes. I have my grand who loves me, who supported me, who's raised me. But this is my life, you know. And if I don't fight back, if I don't take a stand, you know, then I'm essentially saying I'm allowing anybody to do as they want um, with me. These years have really taught me resilience. These years have of fighting, you know, have really taught me courage. Because you know, there are a lot of people who don't understand the case, although the records are out there for everybody to read. And so if it wasn't for them, also the support of people, my family, my friends, my lawyers, I wouldn't be here. So really, the resilience isn't just a resilience from me. It is resilience from my community, right, that I've, I've drawn from them. But yeah, you know, like... No journey has been easy. I think even through history, we've learned that, you know, with whatever politically motivated struggle that anybody has embarked on, it will take time because there are forces who don't want you to, to achieve justice. There are forces who don't want you to right wrongs. And, and so for me, I don't want to be comfortable in discomfort. I don't want to be comfortable with the wrong, you know, um, especially if it's happening to me. This, this crisis that we're facing um, is a crisis that everybody has to kind of play their part in. You know, it's not just the burden on the survivor or the victim. The burden should be on the perpetrator. The burden should be the burden of re rewriting wrongs, right, of change. It should be on those who are responsible for the violence. And so really this involves everybody and... Um, yeah, I don't, want, I don't want to say what should a, a, a survivor do. The survivor is already dealing with a lot. It's what, what can we do as well as people to offer our support, um, whether it's doing your job and doing it properly, legally, within the confines of the law, right? It is ensuring that both, everybody's story is also heard. Everybody. Everybody's story deserves to be heard.